So again, thank you for joining us today's session of the Insperity Business Resiliency Series webcast. My name is Taylor Golden, and I'm a Director of Marketing Strategy here at Insperity and host of this session, Trailblazers in Growth. Prior to joining Insperity, I myself was a small business owner and happened to make the Inc. 5000 list for three consecutive years. When that happened, it was such a moment of validation for me. Oftentimes, no one sees the hustle and blood, sweat, and tears that we pour into our businesses. It's no mistake to grow at this kind of rate, and it feels wonderful to be recognized for that. And so today, I'd like to start off by first congratulating our featured panelists with us today for placing on the 2023 Inc. 5000 list of fastest growing companies in America. You're gonna be hearing their insights and experience of how to rapidly grow a business the right way. And so with that, let's go ahead and meet our panelists. First, I'd like to introduce Matt LaFata, President and CEO of H Architect. Matt, if you wouldn't mind just giving us a little bit of information about yourself and your company. I really appreciate that. Uh, my name is Matt LaFata. I'm the President and CEO of H Architect. We are an HR technology consulting company, which means we help companies find the right HR software to make their lives easier in managing and hiring and the unfortunate firing of people as well. Um, and we're headquartered in Dallas, Texas area, but we have, uh, we're a completely virtual company throughout the US and Canada with about 140 employees right now. Awesome. And have you guys always been virtual? We have actually, uh, well, not always, but about six years ago, we decided to go virtual. Um, our consultants live and you know work where they live. And the only reason we had an office was for HR, administration, sales and marketing. And we realized that nobody was ever coming to actually visit us in this very expensive office. So we decided to give it up and just uh, focus that um, money into the company itself. Wonderful. And is this your first time on the Inc. 5000 list? Actually, it is. Uh, this is the first time we have actually applied as an organization, the first time, uh, uh, obviously, that we made it. And so we're very, uh, very pleased uh, with making the Inc. 5000. And um, whether it's okay. people's promotions, whether it's uh, project go lives, and of course, awards and accolades. So this was a big celebration for us as well. Absolutely. Congratulations. Thank you. Uh, next, I'd like to introduce Amy Deaton, Chief Operating Officer of Evidence Care. Amy, if you won't mind just sharing a little bit about yourself and your company. Thanks, Taylor, and appreciate being here today with Matt and Tracy. Um, Evidence Care is a clinical decision support platform, and we're integrated into the electronic health record. So our users are physicians and clinicians. Um, we are a physician founded organization. Um, we started back in 2016 and we're based out of Nashville, Tennessee. Um, similar to Matt, we have a workforce that is distributed across the United States and overseas as well. Um, we are hybrid. So we have folks that do come into the office and then folks that work remote as well. Big year for Evidence Care. Um, this year is our second year to be on the Inc. 5000 list, uh, making the top 500 this year. So super proud of that. Wow. And even more proud that um, we were named one of the best places to work by the Nashville Business Journal. So our people are really important to us. And lastly, um, second year in a row for our CEO to be named on the most admired CEO list for um, NBJ. So really great year for us. Um, a little bit about myself prior to coming over to software. I like to say I'm a recovering healthcare technology consultant. And so it spends um, over 20 years, I guess that ages me before joining Evidence Care almost four years ago. I'm based out of Nashville as well. And uh, super excited that it's football season and I'm here with my family um, in Nashville. So thanks for having us, Taylor. Thanks, Amy. It sounds like you guys have a lot going on. Congratulations. Thanks. All right. And last but not least, Tracy Call, founder and CEO of Media Bridge. Tracy, tell us a little bit about yourself and your company. Thank you. Amy, congrats. Top 500. I didn't know that. So congratulations there. That's super impressive. Um, I'm, I'm Tracy Call. I'll introduce myself in order of importance in my life. I'm, I'm married to an amazing woman, Pam Kosanke, who is actually the head of revenue for EOS Worldwide. Um, 
it would I would I would advise any business owner that isn't running on EOS to to check it out. Um, we have a 14 year old son and three adopted dogs, so our house is wild and crazy and all things business and barking. Um, I'm also the founder and CEO of Media Bridge, uh, proudly an unfull service ad agency that specializes in media buying and creative services. Um, we believe that the best marketing strategy is to care, and for us that shows up not only um, with this being our eighth year on on the ink list, but also we celebrate our clients um, just as proudly that have shared that list with us. Um, and there's there's several that that are that are on that list with us. That's so awesome when you have not only yourself on the Inc. 5000 list, but also your clients that obviously says you're doing something right. You're growing and your clients are growing at an incredible, incredible rate, no doubt, because you're working together. And that's the beauty of relationships and partnering with the right kind of people. I couldn't agree more. Awesome. Well, thank you, Tracy. Um, let's go ahead and dive into our discussions. Um, so one of our first topics for today is really how to balance growth while maintaining efficiency and profitability, because we know that growth can sometimes be a, a killer for a business if you grow too fast and you're not ready for it. So while maintaining efficiency and profitability, Matt, how would you address that? Yeah, and it's a great question because um, obviously we're a for-profit company. So, um, you know, without that, the company doesn't exist. But if you look at the organization without people, the company doesn't exist either. So uh, there's a reason why people come to work for any of our companies. There's a reason why people come to work for each architect. Um, they hear great things about it, um, whether it is the Inc. 5000, whether it's our great place to work certification or a former colleague or partner tells them about it. So for us, um, it's, it, it's, it's tricky because you have to maintain that uh, customer satisfaction as you grow which tends to um, uh, tends to dip because you're just growing so fast um, and quality can sometimes slip. So for us, it's been the opposite. Our customer satisfaction scores have increased every quarter over the last year of this tremendous growth we're going through, uh, which is over 100% in a 12 month period. And uh, so we're just, what keeps me awake at night is just focusing on culture. So how do we differentiate ourselves from other companies where people could go and do the exact same job because the cost of retraining and, and hiring new people and so forth can really hinder that that growth and hurt that profitability and that efficiency so uh so for us we'll first take care of people they'll take care of your clients and everything else sort of falls into place love that thank you Matt. I, Go totally, ahead. I totally agree with that um and i think uh to to snowball off uh, of what you said, I think like right people, right seat is really important and being able to predict and look around corners to make sure that you've got your team staffed for what your clients upcoming needs are, um, while also taking care of the people on on your side that are um, that high touch point with the clients and making sure that they're happy and the clients are happy as well. But I think like the biggest thing for me has been mastering the art of predicting mm -hmm. what's to come uh, to make sure we've got, you know, the right people, we are offering the right capabilities and we are keeping up with the marketplace as well. I think that is um, something that has been really, really important in keeping efficiency and also profitability as, as we've experienced fast growth. Yeah, I agree with, with both of you. I'm gonna take a little bit of a different angle from, from the seat that I sit in. When I joined Evidence Care, um, I came in at a pivot point and it was really about being flexible and focus. And so for us, the vision remained true, what we wanted to deliver as a company, but being open to looking at different ways to deliver value for our clients. So initially we were direct to consumer and then we took a pivot into integrated technology, which, you know, that was a transformation for our company that would, took work, but we wanted to make sure that we were still providing value in the market that made us viable um, for growth. I'd say the other thing coming in early is being able to say no. So I think for earlier stage companies, it's easy to say yes to anything that's going to pay you, right? That's going to help you make payroll. But at the same time, if you want that scalability, being able to focus and say, you know, this is what we're going to deliver 
and the ability to say no um, helps you build that wash, rinse, repeatable standardization. Uh, can't do that if you're delivering a hundred different things. So I would say those are probably two of the biggest takeaways I've had. Yeah, and I think that's a really good point. If I could add something to that is um, throughout, you know, intense growth, it's easy just to be doing day to day, you know, putting out whatever's coming up, putting out the fire. Um, and you, if you don't take that time to strategically think about, you know, where is the company going and are we going in the right direction? Um, and what other opportunities out there should we also be looking at so we don't become complacent? Yeah. And also to that, I think making sure that your whole team also understands where you're going mm -hmm. and how you're going to get there to empower um, everybody, all key stakeholders in the organization to know what to say no to, because they know that like maybe saying yes to that thing is going to march them in the, the opposite direction of where the company is going. And so having that clear communication throughout the company, so everybody understands what the company goals are and how you plan to get there is so important. That's so true, Tracy. What a great point. That line of communication um, and a very clear flagpole, as I like to put it, like people need to know where they're marching to and be on the same page with you. Oftentimes as leaders, we are the visionaries, but we have to paint that vision and communicate that vision to our people so that they know how to march along with us. And then uh, Matt and Tracy, something else you guys uh, keyed in on is that people. People are oftentimes and should be the foundation of our growth and taking care of our people takes care of our customers. Like it's a trickle down effect. You can't just take care of customers and then let go of focusing on your people. It all kind of falls apart that way. So I love that you focus on people. And that kind of leads into our next topic, uh, common traps to avoid during times of rapid expansion, such as HR, compliance, developing leaders, as you grow at this kind of rate, what are some common traps that you have come across that you try to avoid? Tracy, we'll start with you if you don't mind. Yeah, sure. Um, I think uh, for, for us, the last role people typically hire and companies usually hire is HR. Um, in our organization, we had our head of finance um, running HR. And I think that's so funny because finance people have a very specific skill set and mindset. And I would say HR stands for human and resourceful. Um, and so I think you have to really find that right person that's both human and resourceful. But we've really leaned on Inspire for the last, um, you know, I think five or six years, or Inspire, Insperity for the last five <laughs> or six years. A client of ours top of mind right now um and it's been it's been it's been great because it's allowed us to really find the right person to be the head of people and really lead our people and then use insperity as a resource for all of the compliance and the paperwork and the contracts and payroll and all of those like to do's that a CEO should not be doing. And I, I personally want my head of finance focusing on predicting the future and helping to scale the business and other things other than HR compliance. And so I feel like if, if I would have brought on Insperity earlier and then focused on finding the right head of people to really like lead our people and our culture, um, if I could go back and do it again, I would have, that's what I, I would have done that. Yeah, I agree with you, Tracy. For us, Insperity has been really a great collaborator because healthcare is really highly regulated. And I really want my folks focused on building out processes related to compliance, security, data protection, but we can't let HR responsibilities and that expertise fall by the wayside because, you know, Taylor, you talked about the importance of people. For us, I would say the other thing is professional development and growth of our people, um, you know, it's easy to make that on the back burner. Um, and so we've been able to partner with Insperity to help us develop how, how do we give that right feedback? How do we align with our employees to make sure we understand their growth trajectory and not just uh, the present? Yeah, you know, we're an HR technology company, but we're not an HR company. So, um, you know, we don't we we have an awesome HR director, don't get me wrong, but we don't understand a lot of HR policies. And as a consulting company, we're big fans of outsourcing the things that are not in your wheelhouse that you're not an expert on. And so for us, that is um, leaning on people for uh, human resource policies. Uh, procedures, um, 
even things like 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 taxes or anything like that so um so my advice is always stick to your core um and uh reach out to whether it's mentors for um for you or your your people um but certainly um leave things that aren't within your framework of what you do to experts who do it all the time and that's why you know for, for us in Sparity, just like Amy and Tracy is a wonderful resource because we don't know what we don't know. As we've grown tremendously over the last two years, we've had to put policies in place that we would have never thought about a year and a half ago. And without somebody kind of guiding us down there, um, you know, you, you, you can you can get yourself in trouble. So um, so I think uh, outside experts are, are one era we are just big fans of uh, across the organization. Yeah, that goes back to our uh, theme I think the three of us are in violent agreement on on the art of saying no and you know s saying no to to a service that you may or may not be an expert in and like really leaning on that partner to do that we we had we've done that we've we've tried to build websites in the past we have clients who are like we really just want you to do it you're such great designers and and we've tried it and every time we we think gosh we just should have outsourced this like we should have said no to this um so I think yeah, to, to piggyback on on exactly what you said is like really finding that the art of saying no to things that you aren't good at, being confident, outsourcing, finding those partners um, that are like minded that you feel that you can trust to hand off clients to or bring in or collaborate with is so, so, so important. It is so hard to say no as a leader yeah, sure and uh, and business owner. That's something that I still struggle with to this day. If mm -hmm. someone comes to me with, with a need, they're like, hey, I'm running into this issue, go into problem solving mode. Like, yes, let's do it. Let's figure it out. When sometimes you're creating more problems by stepping into that, like you said, uh, Tracy, if it's not a strength of yours, you really have to be very self-aware of your own strengths and weaknesses. And knowing your weaknesses becomes a strength. Whenever you can take that in into consideration, you're setting yourself and your people up for success. If you're not volunteering for things, that could set them up for failure. I love that you say the art of saying no. That is an art form that I'm still working on mastering. <laughs> mm -hmm. And uh, then Matt, you let us right into to our next topic about outsourcing. So for me, I have this mantra and it's outsource what doesn't make you money. You need to focus on your widget, your, your uh, product or service that is your key part of your business and everything else can be a distraction. It can be a liability, it can be a, a time waster. So if you're able to focus on what makes you money and outsource everything else, I feel like that really helps set you up for this kind of growth that you're seeing now whenever you're looking to outsource, you touched on a little bit, what are the key roles and responsibilities, like roles and relationships needed to achieve growth at scale? Yeah, and we'll start I mean, with you, Matt. Yeah, you touched on a great point because um, I have a motto, um, and you know, I didn't coin this phrase myself, but if it doesn't help you earn or learn, you know, if, if we, whether that's in our, um, private lives or personal lives or professional lives, it makes a lot of sense. And so I never want to take away learning opportunities from the people at H Architect. I actually encourage that. But that stuff within, again, what their skill sets are, what our, what our business needs are. And so when you come across things that, boy, we should be doing this, we should be doing that, rather than trying to reinvent the wheel, somebody out there has already done that. Tap into it, even if it's just asking for advice getting some peer advice you don't necessarily have to go and pay for every um thing that you can't do as an organization there are lots of people out there uh that want to help we all have peers we talk to so um so for us it is it's seeking advice it's paying for advice i mean we are again a consulting company i would never ask somebody to do something for free because i hate when people do it to me um so uh so i think it's important to always look at things that aren't within um what your um company mission is and seek experts to help you be more efficient at the end of the day i i totally agree with you matt i um i i currently outsource sort of board of directors for myself um i as a ceo i'm sure a lot of people on this call can can relate it's a lonely island to be on and you do need a, to find a group of peers. And for me, I found that in the entrepreneurs organization. And so 
I have a group of peers of like-minded other CEOs with businesses that are about the same scales as, as mine, uh, people that are in the same place in life as me. And we get together and talk about business problems, personal problems, like the 5%, the stuff that I wouldn't necessarily be comfortable bringing up in a leadership meeting because it's a fear that I'm circulating in my head and I don't want to necessarily plant that fear um, to the rest of the leadership team. And so for me, it's been really great to outsource this sort of mock board of directors that I can go to and talk about my fears and bring up wild ideas and share what's going on in my personal life. Because usually what's happening in our personal lives is also impacting our professional or professional impacts our personal. Um, so I say that's my biggest outsource is just this community of like-minded other CEOs to help me stay grounded and also validate and my dreams um, and, and work through issues that I'm afraid to bring up in my own boardroom. Yeah, I, I, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the relationship and that network of building. We really promote the networking piece in our organization. Nashville is a healthcare capital, and so we um, build relationships with other healthcare organizations within our community um, and also building relationships with our client partners. So not just thinking of, thinking of them as customers, but partners with us in terms of providing really valuable feedback on how we can evolve as a company, how we can make our products and our services better. So really thinking of them as not just customers, but partners with us as we grow our business. Yeah, as human beings, we are relationship based. And you guys have all honed in on that having those right kind of relationships to speak life and wisdom into you at different points in your life, whether professionally or personally. Uh, Tracy, I know something you mentioned in our previous conversation is you hired a soul coach. And I love that. Uh, because our personal lives and our professional lives are interconnected uh, as business owners or uh, executives. It's really hard to separate the two and you can try, but it, they're going to affect one another. So it's, I think it's really wise that you hire the right kind of people or align yourself with the right kind of people whose opinion you trust that can speak into those moments for you. You, you mentioned trust, um, Taylor. So I, I think I'll touch on that. Like one of our strong beliefs at our company is relationships are built on trust, as you mentioned. And I'm going to give a little plug for something Tracy had mentioned earlier. And part of what we're hearing, we're hiring a lot of folks right now. And what we're hearing from candidates is they want transparency. And transparency is built on trust. And so um, one of the things that I'd share as an organization, we use the EOS um, that Tracy had talked about, the Entrepreneurial Operating System. Um, a book called Traction by Gino Wickman. And it really allows transparency across the organization. And one of the key concepts is every person in the organization, every quarter has a, has a defined set of rocks or milestones that they want to achieve. And that goes all the way from the top to the CEO, all the way through every employee. And they all need to align to what our company vision is. And so going back to what our annual goals are, et cetera. So there's that transparency that builds trust and relationships and communication all throughout our organization. So that's been an, uh, a, in a really important tool in our toolbox um, that's helped us really grow um, efficiently. Yeah, and I know Tracy used the phrase earlier that being a CEO is a lonely island. Um, mm -hmm. and, and that's true. Um, you, you know, I've, uh, none of us know everything. I'm fortunate um, that I have five incredible women uh, on my executive management team with all different backgrounds, um, uh, you know, skill sets, but we all have the same vision. We all have the same passion of where we want to take the company. So for me, it is, it's, we all trust each other. So uh, we bounce ideas off of each other. We don't do anything in a vacuum. They're all responsible for different parts of the organization. And so, you know, when you bring together the opinions of, of a core group of people, um, that can change your mind. It can help you look at things differently as long as you're open-minded to all of that. Um, so I think, um, uh, you know, Amy used the word trust. I mean, it, it is, it's trust in your, your people process, where your organization's going, but don't try to do anything alone. Don't do it in a vacuum. It, it very rarely works. Yeah, I think that's so spot on, Matt. We don't have to do things in a vacuum. Uh, like you guys talked about, building these relationships and these networks with advisors and board of directors and just other people that 
you trust to speak life into you at different moments in your career, um, you don't have to do it alone. Like everyone needs someone to lean on and to throw ideas against the wall with. And it's so wonderful that you have those key relationships set up. Um, something else you mentioned before, Matt, was um, development for your people. And that is kind of like a standard expectation now in the job market. Employees have a higher standard uh, that they're holding companies to. They want to have development and resources and be able to grow as an individual, which is wonderful because that shows us that they're growth minded as well. And we need growth minded individuals. Mm -hmm. But again, as we're growing at this kind of rate and going through all this change, maintaining a strong company culture can be a difficult thing. And you guys have mentioned points of how you are maintaining that culture. If you wouldn't mind just diving in a little bit more. And Amy, I'd love to start with you if you don't mind. Sure. I mean, values are extremely important to us. Um, I, I think one of the key things is a challenge with a distributed organization. You know, I'm sure folks that have um, folks all over the country, one of the things we do is we have a virtual town hall um, that clues everybody in the company and we do value shout outs. So it's not just having values that are a poster on your wall or on your website, um, but also gives an opportunity to build transparency because you're aligning values and giving shout outs to your peers. Um, a another interesting thing that we've done that's been also a really br a brand recognition for us is um, one of our co-founders is a veteran Marine, our CEO is an army vet and uh, we use something called the challenge coin um, we have an evidence care challenge coin and it comes from the concept of it represents our pride our membership our excellence but whenever somebody can hold it up you have to challenge your team to say do you know our values do you know our mission do you know our vision and so it's sort of been a a, a fun way for us to make sure that we're living um, our values every day I, I totally agree, Amy, and you're, I can hear you using the EOS entrepreneurial operating system language, and it's like this is turning into an advertisement for them, and <laughs> that's not what it's supposed to be, but I believe in it so much, and I think I that the foundation is EOS, and somebody asked in the chat the name of the book. The book is called Traction by Gina Wickman, but there are a lot of really great books out there that explain what EOS is in a you know lots of different ways, from fable to actual down and dirty like nuts and bolts of how to operate traction within your organization. Um, but for us, traction has been a foundation. Um, the the first day that you that you work with an implementer or you start working on traction, you develop your your core values for your company. And like Amy said, they're not just words on a wall. Uh, we use those core values when hiring clients, firing clients, hiring team members, coaching team members out and releasing them back into the industry if they're not a core value fit. And so like really understanding what those core values are and making sure that you're building a team that are aligned to those core values is critical. I can literally say that we have 50 plus people in our organization. I genuinely like everyone. Like I really do. And I don't think a lot of people can say that they have an organization of our size. Um, we have very low churn um, at the, at the agency and, uh, I think that is that is key and foundational to the operating system that we're on and kind of going back to what we talked about in the beginning is getting everybody aligned towards the same mission and understanding where we're going and why we're going there. And then having a system of communication within the organization from weekly meetings that people really actually want to go to because they're productive and they're solving real issues and they're holding people accountable in a way that is respectful and motivational and not like shaming and demeaning. And then there's a system for from the leadership team meeting, um, cascading down big important decisions that were made. So everybody feels like they're part of this company and this company's growth and that they have a voice as well. I think making sure that you're creating space within your organization so everybody has a voice, so everybody has a say. And then like the cherries on top are, you know, you can eat breakfast, lunch, and dinner here. We pay for your parking in a really cool trendy area of town as long as you're coming in three days a week. Um, and so like those fun things that don't really matter unless you have a great culture are, are really, really critical. Yeah, and I think, you know, we have to remember all the time, one size doesn't fit all. I mean, we're an incredibly diverse organization, all different age groups. Um, you find that younger people, they want to be challenged so much more than people that maybe have been in the workforce for a while. Um, 
And, and so you have to kind of learn different ways of motivating people of what's important to them. Um, and, you know, and it does all come down to culture. Again, there's a reason why people come to work for our companies. There's a reason why people love to work for our companies. Um, you know, they have to, there has to be an element of fun in what you do. I mean, you spend so much time in work mode and work with work people that, um, uh, like you said, Tracy, I, I get to know everybody that works at the company. It gets harder and harder. You know, you're up to 100 and we're up to 140 people now. But um, it's what I hear all the time is feedback is, wow, our CEO actually knows my name or he, you know, knows this about me or knows that about me. Um, that resonates with people. And when you're a completely virtual company, you have to over communicate. People can't feel like they're, they're out on an island. So we do, we have a, a technology called Slack, which is something that people communicating with each other all day long. We have channels on the HR pets. So people will post pictures of their pets for, for people to see. We have virtual trivia um, nights, you know, once a month, virtual happy hours. So it, it's doing little things that may not seem like a lot to some people. Not everybody's going to participate, but you do enough of these and people participate in different things and they talk and we live in such interesting times where social media um, permeates everything we do. So if you're not doing things right, everybody's going to know about it. And also, I think if you are doing things right, people do talk about that. So um, so that focus on culture just has to be number one. And I think that's why all of us are here today as fast growing companies, because people want to come work for us. Yeah, it can be so easy to overlook culture. Um, like I think you said, Tracy or Amy, um, it's not something that immediately makes us money. It's often something that's uh, an afterthought when you're building a company and growing so fast. But it's so critical to keep your culture intact, especially in, a, in this virtual world that we find ourselves in. Being connected to one another um, is you have to have it. And then, Matt, you talked about communication. I don't think it's possible to over communicate, <laughs> um, but I think we should all try, especially in a virtual world, about including the people that are uh, that are not able to join in person. I myself have virtual team members and we have to go and make extra do extra measures to make sure that we include people and stay connected. And it's just something that you have to build into your business and your processes. So I love that you touched on that. Okay, we've got one last question for our discussions today. Uh, everyone on this call is listening in because I'm sure you want to learn how to do the same, how to grow at the rate that these wonderful companies are growing at um, and the fastest growing companies in, in America. So uh, Matt, Amy, and Tracy, please share some lessons that you've learned in the process, advice that you would give to people that are looking to grow like you have. And Amy, why don't you kick us off? Sure. We touched on this a little bit. I'd say go slow to go fast. Um, sometimes um, we we try to be so reactive and um, try to just knock out the fires and, and execute right in the now, but sometimes you have to take a step back um, call on that network, call on your strategic partners to look at three, five years out because you want to make sure you know where you're going. So I always say sometimes we need to go slow to go fast. And then people, people's been the theme all day, getting the right people in the right seats. Um, don't just hire to check the boxes on a skill set list because you're going to be disappointed. Um, we've all talked about our values and making sure that people are aligned to that as well as a skill set and also looking at not just the skill set that they have now, but do they have the, the desire, the passion to grow with you? Because um, growing isn't easy. It takes some grit. And so making sure you have the right fit for your organization. Yeah, I think, um, you know, go slow to go fast is a great way to look at it. And I was just talking to some of my management team last night as we're I, I said earlier, there's such a dynamic team. They come up with an idea, they want to execute it right away. And I've been saying, you know, all of us want to do that. So, but we have to slow down a little bit and think about, um, uh, are we setting a precedence? Are we doing something that we have to walk back from later? And so, um, so I think that's really important. We all have great ideas. We all want to act on them. We're all moving very fast in our businesses and our world. So I love that. And I, I take that also to when we're hiring. Um, I go by hire slowly fire quickly. So you have to take your time and find people 
um, who are a right fit. Just don't do that that uh, knee jerk. We got to put somebody in right now. Check the box. Get that person in it. No, you got to take the time and make sure they're a culture fit because if they're not, that's where the fire quickly comes in. They can really uh, disrupt an organization. You can lose good people and a lot of goodwill you've built uh, by holding on to somebody too long that can be toxic to the culture. So. You know, as I'm talking about this again, it's all about people. So it really is. That's what makes your company. So just focus on your people, the ones you're looking to add to your company and the ones that you have, um, and just take your time in doing it. And as you make business decisions, take your time, bounce ideas off of people. Uh, everything you may come up with, somebody probably has already tried it, done it, had success or had failure. So um, use knowledge that's out there wisely. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you both. And I think uh, another way of, of saying that too for us is enter the danger. Um, don't be afraid to make a hard decision uh, when you know it's the right one. So the the hiring slow, firing fast, I, I totally agree with that, but I would add, add to that like with grace, um, like with respect, with love, making sure that um, you are showing the people that are staying that even if, you know, we have to make a hard decision on an employee, typically it's it's best for them if it's best for us. If we're feeling the pain, they are too. And being really graceful with that and doing it with care, um, I think just like really sets the tone for the rest of the organization. Um, and then, you know, not not putting your head in the sand when there's a hard decision to make, whether or not it's with a hire or a fire or saying no or letting a client go. Um, I think oftentimes we as leaders, sometimes move too slow on decisions that we know are the right thing to do because it's hard. And so we have to be comfortable doing the hard thing sometime because that that is um, transparency is trust, like Amy said. And we just we have to be able to like enter that danger with confidence and care uh, for our people, our community and our clients. Yeah, Tracy, I think we always have to do empathy and kindness is so important in everything we do. I mean, we have to remember that employees are people. I mean, they've got families, they've got things going on in their lives that we may or may not know about. So I try to always look at everything I do with empathy and kindness. Obviously, we're, we, we're a, a business, I'm a business owner um, and the interest of the business, you know, is is vitally important so that we have a business going forward. But um, I mean, if, you're, if you you have to treat people with kindness and, and just be empathetic to everybody's situation. Last one. Love it. There's so many quotes to pull out from this conversation. Go slow to go fast. The art of saying no, hire, <laughs> hire uh, slow, fire fast. Like I want to write all of these on my, on my wall in my office as <laughs> reminders to myself. Um, Matt, Tracy, and Amy, thank you so much for your insights and, and for sharing your experience of growing your companies at the rate that you have. Um, so that wraps up our discussion for today. Um, at Insperity, we seek to partner with our clients and to achieve the very thing that um, that we're talking about today, how to grow and scale your business with grace, with empathy. Um, and it's our continued privilege to serve our clients and their employees in this way. So if you're not yet an Insperity client, but you're interested in learning more and how to grow your business, go ahead and go to insperity.com right now and let's start a conversation. As always, we thank you for being here with us today and we look forward to talking with you again at our next session. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank you.